Hello and welcome to Who's Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we're talking about a classic, an old movie. Yes. As the kids now would be calling it, The Matrix. Yes. 20 years old. I this know. Year, 1999. It's so interesting, really, kind of, you know, the, the way your mind works in relation to these things. Because I remember, you know, I worked with older colleagues, like, you know, when I, when I first started teaching, you know, and, like, films from the 1950s seemed absolutely prehistoric to me, right? Like, it was, I don't know, almost like before time began, right? Like, you know, and I always kind of had this curiosity about... You know, what was it like to see Rebel Without a Cause, like in a proper cinema when it came out, and how did people react, right? It was it was almost like, you know, you thought of it as a previous century, just because it was before you were born. And of course, now, myself, you know, I first started going to the pictures in the 70s, yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know, kind of, for me, something like The Matrix, it feels like yesterday that I saw it, right? And yet, of course, it's 20 years old. And yeah, it's kind of its 20th anniversary re-release of the film. Mm. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's interesting how you... With a mind. restoration. Yeah. That's what I was saying. It's, it's, it's weird to me, I'm 30, it's weird to me to, to a film that, that genuinely was one that came out when I was a kid and I saw when I was a kid. Yeah. I would have been a bit too young for it because it's a 15, but nonetheless, I saw it when I was a kid. Um, weird for that to have a restoration. Like yeah. You kind of think of quote unquote old movies as well. It's very obvious that they're old. Everyone in them is dead, and the films look different, and they're in black and white, and they're the wrong shape, and that's what an old movie is. Yeah. Now this is not movie. In fact, it's happened before. The, the um, couple of years ago at the Symphony Hall, remember we went to see There Will Be Blood. Yes. There Will Be Blood, the Paul Thomas Anderson film with, and it had, they had a live orchestra yes. playing the score. And um, I was surprised at how many people who were probably basically 10 years younger than I was, overhearing their conversations, they were talking about it as an old movie. Yes. You know, like a classic or something. And it's like, yes. this is a film from 2007. Yes. You know, that's, that was very peculiar to me. Yes, it's true. Though that makes sense. You know, 2007 is 12 years ago. Yeah, and it was and, well, it, would, it was 10 years ago when we saw... Okay, so it. even if you're 10, I mean, the film would have come out when you were 8 years old. I mean, to you, it's an old movie. Yeah. To an 18-year-old or 20-year-old, it's an old movie. I mean, I find that... It's taken me a while to learn, but I finally understand it. <laughs> yeah, right. mind you, I think that is still peculiar to me. Like, I think when I was their age, I wasn't thinking of films that had come out ten years previously as old. But the, I kind of thought of those films as being of a different era, you know. Which and uh, you know, to you talking about films that you saw in the seventies and eighties, like I, I guess I would maybe think of them as oldish. But, well, um, you see, when I was going to the pictures in the seventies, what was being shown on television was really from the 30s to the 60s, yeah. right? And the 30s being shown late at night, right? Like, I, I saw all these Warner Brothers films because the CBC in Canada was showing them at around 11.30 at, yeah, at night or something. So that was the old show, right? Um, so, and then and you realize that, you know, the difference between, like, you know, 1943 and 1973 is just, it was 30 years. Well... You know, kind of, mm. yeah. Thirty years ago is like nineteen ninety, practically, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it would, and yet you don't think I don't think of films of the eighties as old in the same way that when I was a child I saw, you know, Betty Davis films or something. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I know what you mean. Uh, um, so, it's, um, it's funny how it works. Yeah, but I think that how, how Cleopatra Cleopatra lived closer to us than she did to the building of the pyramids. Oh. You know? Mad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the restoration. Yeah, so I must say, I wasn't that... I didn't... I felt a little bit let down by the restoration. Um, I think I have seen The Matrix at the cinema before. I think it may have been re-released once before. I'm, I'm sure I've seen it before. But, um, uh, you know, it's supposed to be this 4K restoration. And I suppose it would have been lovely to have seen it on the IMAX digital screen. That Cineworld has when it wasn't, it was shown on a regular cinema screen. Um, I mean, it's not like the film looked bad, but I just didn't notice anything especially kind of sharp or beautiful about the image. I was disappointed because I remember the film as being like shiny and glossy, mm. you know, with these lovely blacks and greens, yeah, like, you know, 
that the image had a depth to it, a depth and a smoothness, yeah, mm. was actually, um, I think it must be the projection system at Center World, right? You know, I kind of, my first impression of the first 10 minutes or so was that, you know, it looked a bit thin for a restoration. You know? I think I think it was projected digitally. I think this is why they were talking about it being a 4K restoration. And I think that that makes black levels lighter. You know, because right. the whole thing is having light shone through it. Because I, I saw seven re-released and it was, it was projected on film at Cineworld and it looked unbelievable. And that whole film is just symphony of blackness. Yes. You know, shadow and, and darkness everywhere. And you really felt it like the whole cinema was dark because of it. And I think this suffered from you know, not having been projected like that. Yes. I saw Seven in a silver, I think it was a silver nitrate or silver oh, yeah. emulsion copy or whatever it was. And that glowed like magic. So it had all those deep blacks, but then like a kind of, a, you know, a silvery amber that just seemed to glow. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I'm so I, wasn't, I wasn't that impressed with, actually, with the, the, the look of it as a kind of artifact. Mm. Obviously, the look of it as a film Yes. It's incredibly special. It remains so. And it, it does remain so. And there, there are these... Like, you, you, you kind of said yesterday, after we come back, you said they were inventing iconic imagery. Yes. You know, like on the fly. Yes. I mean, you know, kind of... I mean, to me, the film is a masterpiece, really. So, you know, um, some people think it's, it's shallow, right? That you know, the ideas that it's dealing with is not dealing with anything new and it's not dealing it in any kind of particularly complex way. I don't agree. I mean, I, you know, I would say, what films are you comparing it to, right? Which kind of films takes on that whole cyberpunk thing, you know, applies it to Baudrillard, kind of, and encases it all in this, like, fantastic action movie, you know, that is also kind of visually stunning and kind of imaginatively stunning. I mean, you know, there are things like, you know, when Neo touches the world, right? And it seems to, like, uh, get, get stuck and bend to his hands, right? Or the mirror. Yeah, when he begins yeah. to sense his powers, right? You know, I mean, that's, that's it remains fantastic, even though now it's probably very easy effect to obtain digitally, right? Yeah, and one or two of those effects actually look... Um, sort of more dated than I expected. I, there, there are certain films, and I think this is one of them, where the effects were kind of groundbreaking at the time and actually stand up today still. Oh yeah, Jurassic completely. Park, Terminator Two, this. Th these are all films where you know they were kind of inventing these things, but they. I don't know. They, there's something about them that they still convince. Well, you know, I think it's, it's not just about the visual quality; it's about the story and the filmmaking around them that makes you believe them. I think it's because it's a film in which each shot is judged right it's there for a purpose and for an effect so you know when you get these special effects they're not just there for you to go wow they're there you know to poetically render something about the world right mm. that it's dealing with or or the theme or that story point i mean you know kind of when neo touches the matrix right and kind of and it gets seems to get stuck to him you know it's it's not just for you to go wow it's actually for you to understand, kind of, you know, how this world is is constructed and malleable, yeah, and yeah. yeah, it's kind of a beautiful poetic effect, I think. Yeah, and it's that Alice through the looking glass thing mm. down the rabbit hole, which you know, it's all kind of referenced in 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 dialogue, yes. very explicit. That's why it's a mirror in that scene in particular. You know, it's, it's I think it's a direct reference or kind of, it's all, it, was, it was almost like a pun on Alice through the looking mm. glass, like. It's a, it's a looking glass in that it will be a looking glass here, mm. you know, and that's how it's used. Although some of the things sometimes don't make sense. I mean, um, I was I was surprised. It's about it. It's a while since I've watched it all the way through, mm. um, and it's it's always been. I, I, I said to you during it, like I keep forgetting how many cool scenes are in this. Yes. Every time this, I remember the next scene. Oh, I remember this. Oh, I remember this. How can I have forgotten all this cool stuff that's happening? And it remains just as cool and, and exciting. But um, I was sort of surprised in watching it the whole way through how it how freely it kind of picks up and drops ideas and motifs mm. like it, the whole kind of story carries everything through but there are points where you know that they'll pick something up, like that mirror bit they'll kind of pick it up and drop it and the, the idea of it kind of um the, the mirror growing all over him 
and then it's going to go down his throat and it becomes this thing of a race against time if you think about it for a second doesn't seem to make all that much sense like what then what then actually is it and why are they why have they put something in this room that could be dangerous to him when they're supposed you know there's well, sort of weirdness in it I, mm, but I, 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 I find those things cohesive because that's meant to be a kind of a virus isn't it well I don't know I mean that's what that's when they're freeing him from the matrix mm. and um you know, you think they would just be sort of taking control and, and just controlling the situation. But then to have something in the room which all of a sudden can pose a threat to him and make it a race against time to get him out mm. is, is weird. And it seems to just be there to make a... For a cinematic effect, basically. Mm. To make a kind of threat in mm. that moment. Um, but, that, but, I mean, that's nitpicking. I mm. agree. You know, I could, can understand why you're looking at me with a sort of, well, what are you doing face. But actually, the film kind of does one or two things like that a little bit more often than I thought. But it, but overall, none of that matters. Because despite the fact that it's kind of picking things up and dropping them, the entire thing is cohesive. And it moves. And it's so full of ideas. And, I would look, and I'd much prefer a film to be full of ideas that are dropped or not fully explored than have like one idea that you get bored of. <laughs> yes, I think it's such an inventive uh, film. Um, and kind of, and so interesting in the way that it places itself, you know, in, in what well, was at that time, I think, a kind of an alternative discourse or an underground discourse or an emerging discourse, right? You know, so um, like the novel New Romancer and Neil Gaiman's um, work and I understand that like the Sandman is kind of like an influence the comic book that Neil Gaiman wrote um, and um, you know Baudrillard's philosophy right they, they all kind of tie in neatly together but it's kind of a particular view of the world that was kind of emerging and that it kind of emerged with the rise of the computer in a sense right yeah. you know and and how it then gets played out in this film I think is beautiful uh, it really kind of fits into that late 90s era that that I thought about before, and it's kind of peculiar to me, because there's an era of cyberpunk and kind of rave culture, um, and uh, that, the music is the music really speaks to me in that, yeah. in that respect. It's really evocative of it. Some of it is not like that in the film, but the, the piece of me, if you go and look up the um, the kung fu scene where yeah. they're fighting in the dojo, the music that goes under that is pure late 90s sort of rave techno, and it's a kind of music that stopped at the turn of the century and I think it's kind of a whole culture that stopped at the turn of the century so there's like The Matrix is the only one that kind of broke through I think and carried on because it was so successful and huge mm. and a bit different but if you look at things like The Beach or Johnny Mnemonic or yes. um, Existens the Cronenberg yes. film these yes. are all are kind of these are all sort of films that were, were speaking to an emerging culture that was learning about what the internet was and was developing something new and was very young and vibrant and Seriously, like it's like 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 nine eleven seemed to stop it. Yeah, it's like it stopped just like innocence and weirdness stopped. And and actually, to those I would add that stodgy Sandra Bullock film, The Net or whatever it was called. Hackers was it? Or, no, there's The Net she, and there's Hackers. Right. And then, what's that other Keanu Reeves film? Through a lens darkly or something. The Scanner anime, darkly. That Scan was much. That was long after it. That, that was, was long after. That it. was like two thousand and six or seven. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Oh wow. See, I lose all track of time. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, no, that's a really good film, Scanner yeah. Darkly. And uh, I think these films are, are fun movies. And they're, all, they're not all that great. These other mm. films I've mentioned. Um, but there is something very peculiar to me about that. Like you, you can normally see trends and movements in in all sorts of arts kind of grow and fade and grow and fade when, but this one just seems Spielberg? to stop immediately when was that Spielberg film with Jude Law and Ethan Hawke AI AI that yeah. was 2002 okay was it? it was the one that Kubrick was making and then he died and, right and uh, uh, Spielberg took it over okay yeah. that, had, that had a similar sort of thing yeah well that's why I'm bringing it up yeah, right yeah. it kind of you know it's, it's, it's part of that era and I think of any of those films that attempted it including what is it, Dark City as well, which I love. I haven't seen Dark City. I love Dark City. But I think by far this is the superior film to any of those. Yeah, right. well, that's kind of why I suppose I'm trying to bring them up and draw a distinction yeah. because this is the one that was obviously hugely success successful. But it does make me kind of try and work out why. You know, was there something oh. more kitschy about these other ones? Or was there something more of their time? Why is it The Matrix succeeded was it was it kind of drawing was it just it's, was it just better made it's better made <laughs> it's more beautiful and it gives you a lot of those imminent pleasures that cinema can give 
on a big screen. <laughs> yeah. You know. So for example, I was re uh, you know, and I don't think I'm being shallow. I think this is one of the pleasures that's need to be examined about cinema itself. I was just kind of gobsmacked anew by how beautiful Keanu Reeves <laughs> and Carrie Moss are, right? You know, but because of my own particular orientation, I was looking more at Keanu Reeves, right? I mean, it's just beautiful to see him, mm. you know? It's like, he moves beautifully, he looks beautiful, you know, kind of the bullet time thing where he bends over. I mean, he's, he just looks beautiful, right? Mm. The, yeah, don't you think? I mean, that is a great no, pleasure in kind of in film going, really. Yeah. You know, or the blue of, um, or uh, not the blue, I don't think it's blue, actually, the color of Carrie on, Carry on Moss's eyes, right? Like, again, just little things like that, to see it on a big screen. Probably green. Everything in the film is green. Well, I'm not sure now, but, you know, and this is terrible because I saw it yesterday, but I can't really remember the, you know, all I remember is that the color of her eyes struck me as being beautiful. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to find a picture because um, because the internet. Right. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, they were kind of bluey green. Yeah. They fit in well with that muted matrixy tone. She's beautiful. Well, I I particularly um, noticed um, Lawrence Fishburne just yes. because of how young he looks. I mean, I know you said they all look young. Yes. But you know, do. I think Keanu Reeves basically looks the same. I think oh, no. Carrie Moss, for all I know. Looks the same because I haven't seen her since the Matrix. No, I but think Lawrence Fishburne really looks young, and yeah, it's weird. Well, and it's like, I think Keanu really looks young. If you compare him to John Wick, yeah. I mean, but maybe that's also because I see more '90s Keanu Reeves films, so I'm used to that look. Well, whereas Lawrence Fishburne, this is like the earliest film I know of his. Yeah, you know, I'm familiar. With oh him. no, uh, he was in Apocalypse Now, which has also been revived this I year. I haven't seen. The, yeah, and there that. he's really young. He's like, <laughs> he's like 17 or something. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, I love him. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Keanu Reeves just before I forget okay. um, because you know I just realized because we saw Toy Story 4 right and he plays or he voices Captain Canuck or something right yeah, whatever the, the, the evil Knievel Canadian stunt rider yeah and I was just thinking what an extraordinary year he's had because you know there's is it called Definitely Maybe on Netflix not Where, a clue okay um, can we look it up because yeah um is he's in a Netflix show? He's no, he's not in a. It's a movie made for Netflix, where he plays himself, and it's a romantic comedy, you know. And he's great in it, right? It's, he's very funny, kind of poking fun at his own image. Always be my maybe. Always be my. That's right. Right. Um, always be my maybe. That's right. So uh, you know, the John Wick film, the Toy Story four, uh, the Always Be My Maybe, and then the revival of this. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's yeah, kind people, of people love him. It's, yeah, it's kind of an extraordinary year that he's having, um, and and especially as someone who doesn't seem to do very much normally, right? Like, <laughs> you know, uh, it seems that um, you know he's not only uh, it's it's not only that you know he's appearing in all these successful things because definitely be my baby was a big Netflix thing. Mm. Yeah, uh, um, Toy Story four, of course, massive success. John Wick, massive success. But, you know, they're also kind of different kinds of things, right? You know, so a typical, you know, John Wick is, I mean, I didn't like it that much, really, but, you know, he's very good in it. Um, but it was a massive success, right? And then the voicing of the cartoon, and then this comedy where he's parodying his own image, right? There are mm. different kinds of things that, he, that he's doing, you know? So, uh, hurrah, Keanu. <laughs> I'm sure I thrilled. love you. <laughs> As far as I'm aware, he just builds expensive motorbikes these days when he's not making movies. I think that's honest, he, you know, yeah. I don't know anything. I mean, there's a wonderful article in the New Yorker, you know, about why he's going, yeah, why this affection for him, you know, mm. at the moment, and kind of speculating on what that means, um, you know. So, but I, other than that, I really, you know. I mean, I don't know, except that there's all the, you know, the sad Keanu meme. Yeah. And, yeah. People, yeah. people have grown very fond of him. Um, yeah. You know, which I, which I'm, I'm grateful for, but we're well, grateful. I'm happy about. Um, but, and I'm not like a particular um, fan. I mean, I really don't know anything about his private life or anything. But I am kind of a fan of um, his presence and his daring. Right, like you know, so people say, "Oh, he's a terrible actor," and whatever. And you know, in some ways, he definitely has been, you know. But he's got a very interesting presence, 
and he's and and he knows what to do with it and he's always taking chances right like you know i think my own private idaho where which is like this combination of like grunge and shakespeare and you know queer mm. cinema i mean you know no other young leading man of that era would have kind of you know done something like except river phoenix who he did it with <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right so 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 i think he's earned that affection really um but anyway that was that's just a side point really just a, as commentary that this film is being re-released amidst all of these uh yeah. you know appearances in, in different kinds of very successful films and, and yeah yeah let's return to the matrix then um i think we were both surprised at how slowly it started Yes, I think we remember it as these. You know, we remember the action scenes. We remember bullet time, and yes. we remember the the fight in the lobby. Yes, um, but what we don't remember is how much it takes its time to set things up. Um, and I don't just mean the first kind of ten fifty minutes before he even meets Morpheus, but mm. that is that is a while. Um, but even once he is freed, um, it's it's a good hour or more of kind of explanations and learning the rules of the world and scene setting and all this kind of stuff which is for the audience really and actually I think now to me at least it was kind of boring just because I knew I'm very familiar with all of that so I don't need all those kind of rules explained yeah. to me again and I think I don't think it's ever clunky or anything like that I don't think it's ever clunky or inefficient I think everything is done every kind of rule is explained or every nuance or everything about how the matrix works is explained not just through dialogue, but uh, you know, th through action and filmmaking. It's, it's shown, not told. Mm. And it's also done in a way that asks questions that aren't just about, you know, uh, for instance, in the, in the dojo scene I mentioned, mm. um, it's all about how Neo needs to learn about breaking the rules, about mm. that he's in a system that he is now outside, mm. that he can affect things, he can go beyond the rules that he knows inside. But then it's kind of, it's coupled with this thing of, you think that's air you're breathing now? Mm. You know, like, it's it's done in a way that is evocative and meaningful. And it's not just, you know, it's not as simple as saying, you need to learn this and here is the answer. You know, everything kind of raises a further question. I think, I, I so although it's, it is kind of slow, and I think it was obviously very necessary for new, for new audiences, and you would still need that now if you hadn't seen it before. Mm. Um, it's slow, kind of, but it's also well paced. Yeah. You know, so... Um, one of the things that struck me that I, I had misremembered really is the beginning of the film where it begins with Trinity right and that fantastic moment where she leaps in the air and time is suspended and then she kicks right bullet time was that bullet time yeah the effect is bullet time okay the camera spinning around in, in stop or slow motion okay yeah um I, I it is. Yeah. It's not just okay. when he falls over. It's okay. that's the name of the event. Right. Well, you know, so 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 then at the very beginning you get a taste of that because yeah. you know it certainly kind of is developed kind of later on, uh, in a in a much more dramatic way. But even that initial moment, you think, wow, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just fantastic, and I've forgotten, you know, because that thing is introduced with her, right? Not with Neo, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so it was interesting kind of coming back to the movie and seeing, you know, which are the moments of intensity in this film and how is it get, yeah, how, how do they play out? Mm -hmm. And I think you're right that, you know, the whole first hour is about giving you the kind of information that you need to be able to make sense of what this world is like and what can take place in it, mm -hmm. right? And because what it's like and what can take place in it was then so unusual great care is taken in signaling it and mm. you know kind of situating yourself within that world um so but i think i you know and i did feel um as like you that uh, it was it was slower than i remembered it but i didn't feel that way by the end of the film no not at all i also think it's interesting how the film starts off as a kind of different film by the film that it is at the end, it's very you know it's it's not really an action film at the start, although it starts off with an action scene and a chase. Yes. It it actually starts off kind of like a crime film. Yeah, I think like a noir. Right. Yeah. It's like this guy gets gets involved in something that might be over his head, but he's he's already Neo is already committing crimes. You see him selling this disc. Mm. Yeah. You know, so he's always obviously kind of um, he's living a double life as, yeah, as, yeah. as 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 Agent Smith says to him. But Agent Smith takes him in. You don't know who he is. You don't know that he's. You know, a, a, an agent of the system. You, you think he's like an FBI guy. Um, it's, you know, apart from the fact that you've seen 
an action scene in which mad stuff is happening, kind of unusual stuff is happening, people saying she shouldn't be able to jump that far, that sort mm. of thing. Um, you know, you get this hint of there's something kind of supernatural going on, let's yes. say, or beyond the rules of the world. But apart from that, it's it's a crime movie and it's kind of down to earth and it's it's interesting, like, you know, the, the, the scene under the bridge when she gets in the car, they get into getting the car and it's raining, coming down, it's pure noir mm. and it's beautiful. Mm. And actually, it has a line that I don't like. It has that thing about they, they say it's our way or the highway and he goes to get out of the car and Trinity says um, you know you've been down that road before you know where it leads mm. and he gets back in and it, it's a line that I, I've, ne- I've never had peace with that line because I think it's only I think it's there for effect I can't tell if she's talking about suicide no if, he, if she's talking about knowing that he has tried to commit suicide before Ah. That, that was like the idea of that particular road might have having having been somewhere that he might have. No, I I just had a trauma. I didn't read it that way. Yeah, I mean, I just read it. He's trying to find the answers before, and they've led nowhere, right? So he's yeah, he's tried that world before, and it's led nowhere. This the thing is, I don't know. I it could, it's the use of the words that road. You've been yes. down that road because that road could be. You know, generally, you've been down that path before. You've been down, you know, you've tried to do that sort of thing before. Yeah, or yeah. it could be that road specifically, which the camera then cuts to. Oh. Which suggests, like, there's something specific about that actual road. I've never quite uh, okay, figured well, that line out. I haven't looked at it with the care <laughs> that you have, clearly. It's just struck me as um, something unexplained before. I don't know. But. I mean, I think that, the, you know, the film is suffused with noir imagery. I mean,. You know, the whole initial setting is noir, you know, and I think this is kind of also where it, the influence of films like Blade Runner come in because, you know, kind of clearly in films of this era and beyond, the future is noir, right? And so kind of science fiction becomes more and more and more infused with mm. noir, right? Um, the the future is bleak, <laughs> right? They're yeah. all dystopias uh, that, are, that are being posited. And actually, kind of, I think that's what's so interesting about this film, because on the one hand, you know, it posits kind of the worst dystopia you can imagine, like people become batteries, right? And they're not even aware or conscious of their own existence, you know, except kind of, you know, an imagined one that doesn't really exist. But it takes that and makes it hopeful, you know? Yeah, kind of Mm -hmm. resistance, um... You know the whole uh, last speech that kind of Neil gives on on the phone at the end. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's kind of it's very interesting because, you know, kind of the dystopia is rendered utopian at the end. Yeah, it's because of the people. It's like humanity is what's utopian. You know, I think that's kind of I think that's sort of the message, at least to me. Like the idea is that where 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 humanity is, mm. there is hope. Mm. You know, because the world is not a nice place anymore. The world's fucking horrible. They've had to bury, they've had to dig underground for the last remaining bits of warmth in the earth, Earth's yes. core, all that sort of thing. You know, the world is not a nice place anymore. Um, but it's the people. But the film's message is a utopian one. You can get out of this. Yeah, you can find a solution. You can fight back. Mm. Right, like you can change things. Um, you can beat the system. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, 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 yeah. I'm kind of rather fascinated by that, really. Um, there's um, it's something that struck me, which I don't think's ever struck me before about the film, which is about everyone else who's still plugged into the Matrix, um, because for a lot of the film, particularly towards the end, a lot of them become cannon fodder. Yes. You know, like, like the, the the police or security guards who try to stop them. Yes. You know, call for backup in the lobby, and then fifty of them get killed, um, because there's this thing about how, uh, while people are still plugged into the Matrix and not ready to be unplugged. They are innocent, but to our freedom fighters, that makes them enemies because they are part of the system still. And also they can be taken over by agents, which is another sort of uh, thing in it. Um, but the idea that, like, uh, is, it was the first time that it struck me that the only real enemies are the agents. Yes. And it's, I kind of felt bad for all of the security guards who died just because they ha- were in the way and they had to die. Well, they are literally collateral damage, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Right, because they are taken over by someone. They're taken over by the system. They're acting against their will, you know, and they die as a result. Or, yeah, they're, they're acting unconsciously rather than 
They have yeah. no will. Yeah, you know, exactly. They, you know, so under false pretenses. Or, yeah, you know, they're being fooled into f- acting a certain way. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what I found very interesting, which I think is kind of now you can see it uh, throughout the Wachowski's career, really, is their inclusivity, right? Mm. Because so you know you have Keanu Reeves as the star, right, and he's kind of mixed race. Um, and then, is it? Is uh, it? yes, he is. I think he's Hawaiian and you know, he's okay. Chinese Hawaiian or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and um, then you have Lawrence Fishburne, and then like uh, all of the crew of the ship, all of the good guys, right? You know, they're either like Chinese or black or Latino or mm. yeah. It's it's kind of unusual to see that ra- yeah that r- racial range, so to speak. Yeah, and all all of the bad guys are all white. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah white men in suits, exactly, combed hair, all the rest. Yeah. yeah, so, and I thought that, and I think that's very symbols of conformity and and sort of whiteness. Mm. I mean, actually, it's it, um, Thomas Anderson's boss, Thomas Anderson being Neo's mm. human name. <laughs> um, his boss I, he looks like Agent Smith. Yes. looks like sounds like Agent Smith. Yes. You know, they're all part of the same system to keep yes. them in control and all the rest. Yes, and it's. A very white and kind of corporate yes, thing. Yes, exactly. You know. Right. But it's very unusual in a film of that time, A, to have given a female protagonist that amount of action sequences, right? Like Carrie Ann Moss is an action heroine. Um, and then to have made all of the good guys Latinos, yeah, Chinese, black. Yeah. Yeah. I th- yeah, in fact, the one bad guy amongst the good guys is Joe Pantoliano. That's right. He's just a New York... So, um, and also, was it the character Switch who's on the dikey side? You might say. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So you know, um, so to have had that range of types. Yeah. Right. I think uh, for some reason it should have stood out more to me when I first saw it, but I think I, I didn't really quite register that as one of the film's pleasures. But in retrospect, it becomes one. And in retrospect, and, and looking through the Wachowski's career, it's actually a characteristic of their work, mm. you know, um, that inclusiveness. Uh, so that was pleasing. Um, how did the action sequences hold up to you? Brilliantly well, you know. I, you know, the I, I, thing is, I, when, we, when we saw this, it was supposed to start at 8 o'clock. And then, because we thought there weren't going to be trends and stuff, because it, it was... You know, reshowing a one off, yeah, yeah, exactly. And there were there were fucking twenty five minutes of trailers and adverts, so it actually started at twenty five past, which meant that it was going to get. I was going to basically get to work nearly an hour late. Mm. So, so by the time the action was starting, that was like ten o'clock when I need to be at work. Mm. <laughs> and and so on, on the one hand, I was kind of going, oh well, I'm going to be late, but the action just made me forget <laughs> about all my responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I, I mean, I don't know what's in my old job. I left early once to go and see Lawrence of Arabia. You know, sometimes with you just, me, yeah, with you. Sometimes yeah. you just gotta. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and now, um, yeah, the action just it. I would again. This is something that was uh, kind of a surprise watching it again with kind of fresh-ish eyes. Is um, I suppose I kind of remembered the action as being much larger scenes than they were. Mm. Um, obviously, there is the uh, the lobby fight, which is a single scene. They start it, they fight it, they finish it in one go. But everything else, um, you know, the stuff that when they come, when they're coming to get Morpheus, it's all intercut with Morpheus being tortured by Agent Smith and having yes. that conversation. And that conversation is all about ideas, yes. and all about and what makes us human, and, where, and and Agent Smith being like a prison, this sort of thing. Um, but it's all intercut, and I, I suppose I was um, sort of slightly surprised about it because it's, you know, like. Like, like the bullet time, the famous bullet time mm. bit where he dodges the bullets and, and falls down. Um, it's it's not long into having cut into that scene that that happens. You know, they, they basically, they, they, you hear them go, we're being fought, they're on the roof. You see them fighting on the roof for about 30 seconds and then the bullet time happens. It's not like the culmination of a huge action scene. Mm. It's just a moment. Mm. You know, I was kind of, I don't know... I, 
it, it always felt like a much bigger moment. And it's not like it's a small moment. It is a moment, and it's a huge thing. And he manages to dodge the bullets, which he's been told no one can do. And they manage to shoot the agent, which they've been told no one can do. So it's a massive thing. But the the pacing surprised me. The way it was intercut surprised me. I'd forgotten how it worked. Yes. You know. Um, but it worked very well. It's beautiful. Um, what did you think of the philosophical dimension of the film, right? Because this is a film in which people who were into it, geeks, went over every line like it was a line of the, from the Bible or something, yeah. right? Like, you know. Uh, <clears throat> well, I th this is another reason that I was bringing up all those other films before Existence and mm. The Beach and that sort of thing. Because I think one of the commonalities between all these films or at least the, some of the best examples of them, is they were all trying to talk about similar sort of ideas. Yes. These ideas were in the water at the time. Yes. And The Matrix is just one film that is dealing with them. Um, but I think, I think one of the reasons that you know, we were saying these films kind of didn't, didn't, didn't stand the test of time or kind of last in the way that The Matrix has is because The Matrix deals with them much more successfully and much more intelligently and raises more interesting questions yes. out of them. And comes up with kind of complex ideas. There, there are there are so many ways of looking at things. Yes. it's like um, it's like it's like Groundhog Day. Like how every ver every every person or every religion that looks at Groundhog Day finds a different way of looking at it. Yes. I think there's a kind of, I think the Matrix has something similar about that. You can find what you're looking for in it. Yes. Well, I think a film. It's a film that lends itself to uh, complex readings. Um, so kind of. You know, I would like to see these people who say, oh, it's a superficial film, it's kind of banal, you know, the ideas that it's dealing with and whatever. Well, you know, again, in comparison to what? Um, and how would, you know, how would you answer this person's reading of the film or that person's reading of the film? You know, who, people make very complex readings of this film. So, so I think it's a film that, you know, has depth um, for those who are willing to engage with it, right? Because, you know, I must say, I'm not one of those people who, you know, wanted to analyze every line and, you know, had 25 different readings of the significance of the blue pill versus the red pill, or, you know, I'm, yeah. uh, I'm not that kind of film goer. Um, but I really like, you know, I really um, have liked reading other people's responses to it on that level. And I think it kind of, it stacks up and it measures up. And if you want to think about those things, the film offers you a lot of food through which, yeah, with which to do it. Yeah, and I think it's an inviting film to think about, kind of metaphorically, as yes. opposed as opposed to the way that, uh, the way that, people really like to think about films these days, which I've been doing a little bit of kind of, as you say, the the blue pill. It's not. It wouldn't be so much like what's the significance of the blue pill and the red pill, but how do they work? Mm. You know, like that's the kind of way people I think like to think about films an awful lot now. Mm. How does it work, and how did this happen, and what's going to happen next? Do you, or films with uh, films with ambiguous endings. Mm. You know, well, what logically must happen next? Well, the point of an ambiguous ending is it doesn't matter. It's cueing you to think about things differently, to mm. think about things metaphorically and thematically. Mm. Um, this film is not one with an, with an ambiguous ending, I don't think. You know? No. Um, and, it, and it does go on in the sequels to develop its world an awful lot more. Um, and in fact, but, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an ambiguous film, except that I think it's rich enough to allow for ambiguity, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah, like kind of, you know, at every moment when you're watching it, for me anyway, things are perfectly clear. And, and actually one of the things that I love, you're also geographically situated in the action. You know, which I um, require, you know, in order to be satisfied. Um, but I think it's just a film that is so rich that actually it lends itself to many different readings and many different interpretations, really, that you can then kind of test against, against another. Um, so I think it is a kind of a complex film. Certainly it's one through which philosophy has not only been read, but done, right? Yeah. You know, um, so so um and it's been and it's put right in there from the start you yes. know um there, there was this, there's this whole thing about Baudrillard and how in one of the first drafts of the script Baudrillard was name checked at one point in the in the scene where um Morpheus is telling Neo about the desert of the real yeah he, he said a, a, you know as Baudrillard said was in his dialogue in one of the early scripts which would have been a bit too clunky but yeah. still you know we the, saw the book still yeah the book that he gets a discount of his simulacrum simulation the chapter that he opens up to is on nihilism yeah. that must mean something yes <laughs> <laughs> you know these things are name checked um, you know there, there's a whole kind of allegory of the cave thing going on as well mm. um, I think the interesting thing about the allegory of the cave is that 
as I recall it, in the allegory of the cave, part of it is that you 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 know you, you sit you're sat there watching these flames flicker on the wall, and you become an expert in how the flames flicker, and you mm. go, well, that means this and this means that, and I'm so good at the flames, and then you get let out and you see what actual sunlight looks like, and you're like, that's not a tree, the shadow, that's a tree, I know what a tree looks like, mm. but eventually you realise this is actually what the world is, and I've mm. had the wall put over my eyes, but the point is, you go back into the cave and try and tell everyone else, and they think you're a dickhead, mm. you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, this is what trees are, and that kind of final part of the allegory of the cave is kind of interesting, because I think that's sort of what you know, when they talk about the people not being ready to be unplugged yes. in this, then you know, that kind of speaks about those. There's, there's a kind of, it's it's not as simple as freeing people. You know, people actually aren't ready to be free. They won't accept what they've been told. Now, I mean, you know, part of the thing is Neo is throwing up and denying it all over the place at the start. It takes a long time for him to accept what he's being told. Mm. And I I think that kind of, the kind of expression of the mental sort of toll it takes on him early on is kind of interesting mm. you know like it's very easy to kind of jump into well we're going to learn how to fly planes and do kung fu now mm. but the time it takes for him to relearn his world i think is really interesting mm. and again it leads it they're constantly picking up on questions about it like when they're all in the sort of mess hall in the nebuchadnezzar and they're um, and they're having lunch and they're eating that goop Yes, and he says, you know, uh, the dozer says it's got amino acids and vitamins and everything the body needs, and then Mouse goes, it's not everything the body needs, yes. you know, and then he talks about sex, yes, and the, and the kind of the, you know uh, it becomes a, a pimp for the woman in the red dress, yes. <laughs> you know, but it's like it's a, I think that's that's one of those places where I think it's really really elegant. It's telling you the rules of the thing, it's telling you how this world works, but it's doing so in a way that asks you a question: mm. What is it to be human? As you're always so fond mm. of asking. Or is it to be human? What do we need? How do we live? You know, I, th- I think that actually there was a re- it made me think of a really recent Black Mirror episode. Um, I don't know if you've watched the recent no. Black Mirrors. They came up with three new episodes recently. And there's one about uh, a, a kind of virtual reality video game where you put this little dot on your head and you just become the characters in the game. And it's a fighting game. And so this guy plays it online with his mate. And the one guy plays a guy and the other guy plays a girl. And they realise that in the game, instead of fighting, they can have sex. And so they start, <laughs> so they start having an affair with each other, uh-huh. right? And it's a kind of, it's quite a sweet episode actually, because it ends up with this kind of agreement with his wife that you know, uh, once a week you can have sex with your friend, and I can go off and um, cheat on you. <laughs> like it's a, it's a sweet sort of like they they develop a, a new sort of loving relationship. Mm. Um, but that reminded me of it, you know. It's like, like, like. This, this is the kind of things we need and, and we could live through it sort of virtually it's like and what's the difference between what you experience in your head and what you experience in real life like the thing in the Black Mirror episode is this is the best sex this guy's ever had mm. and he becomes incredibly close with his with his friend and it's really troubling for him because of that like uh, yeah okay now it would have been weird I think if they'd done that in the Matrix and mm. like well it's virtual reality we can fuck who we like <laughs> you know it's not the point of the film but you know I, I, I think it's I think that's kind of it's in there not in the same way, mm. but it's, it's in there in, in, in a sense. The sort of, you can make the world what you want, you can live how you want, you know, like this thing about residual self-image. Mm. You, 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 the version of you in the Matrix is what you imagine yourself to look like, and they mm. don't look the same in the Matrix as they do out of it, and they wear all these cool suits stuff. Mm. Like in, um, in Fight Club, mm. the thing about how Jack imagines Tyler, spoilers, mm. um, and it's, it's supposed to be a satire on toxic masculinity, but the thing is, Tyler looks like every, and it's textual. Tyler says, "I look like you want to look, I fuck like you want to fuck. Mm. I am the perfect man in the way, every way that you are not, mm. right? You know, because he's fucking Brad Pitt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's similar sort of thing. Like like, you know, one of the reasons that they can be so cool in the Matrix and look cool to the audience is because they can do what they like. Mm. You can learn to fly a helicopter and start flying around the New York yes. as quickly as you want. You can beat up anyone. You, you know. yes. Anyway, I don't know, I'm going on. but You are. <laughs> um, I want to say a few words just about the look. right? And so we've talked a little bit about the look of the film. But, you know, um, one of the things that's really striking is just the look of Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss, right? With those shades and those coats, yeah, that move so beautifully. And she's wearing rubber, <laughs> yeah. And actually, it's, it's kind of quite clunky. It's like a, yeah, it's kind of very much of its era, like this outfit made of, you know, rubber material. 
Um, but it looks fantastic. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it has become kind of, I think, the poster of them with the that kind of green lettering that resembles the computers of the era, mm-hmm. you know, um, has become like I, I, iconic. Yeah, it's instantly recognizable. You instantly know what it's referencing. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on it? I, it really reminds me of how my mate Ben used to dress, and and, like, <laughs> it's, and it's because it's because that's how Neo dressed in the Matrix. You know, the big long trench coat, leather, this sort of thing. Mm. I, I remember my mate Ben was like, he used to even fucking fold his arms behind his back like Morpheus does. <laughs> like, just go, oh, give it a rest. <laughs> but like, it's, it became a thing that immediately you wanted to copy, and it became, as I was saying, like it becomes it's such a cool image mm. above everything else. It's something that you want to ape and copy, and. You know, one of, one of the things that it made me think of is, because the film is so much of its time, right? Mm. You know, so it still works brilliantly. But, you know, one of the things I thought, I wondered, I wonder what would happen if they'd remake it with, like, smartphones instead of dial phones. Yes. Or, you know, the computers are so large and clunky, right? Like, you know, the, the film begins with this, or the, at the very beginning of the film, maybe not the first image, but... In the beginning, you see Keanu sprawled over, you know, his computer terminals, right? That each looks like a two-ton truck with, mm-hmm. like, these huge keyboards splattered all over his desk, right? You know, and you think, I, I wonder... It's know. absolutely true. And and what really struck me is in the Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the screen setup for all the way they, they interact with the Matrix, you've got the three terminals which have the, the green rain, mm-hmm. and you have various screens on the sides, and... And not not only are there so many screens, whereas if you look at it these days, if you look at something like the Marvel films, for instance, everything that they do in terms of interacting with the computer is all virtual reality, and it's yeah. like holograms and things. Yes. Like that's how it would be done now, I think. Um, not only is it is is it the kind of physicality and the way that it's obviously built out of technology of the time, sort of thing, but it's also how. Um, flimsy it is like every time that Tank presses things and, and goes over and touches a screen the whole setup moves and yes, shakes like yes. it's not it's not solid and I think I think I think it's deliberate you know like the, it's also about the precarity of their situation like they're in this spaceship thing a hovercraft they call it yes. which is vulnerable and by the end it's getting broken into and like that is their only sort of safety they're, they're not they're not out, they're not in Zion what's where, What's the term for that, you know, that Victorian futuristic... Steampunk. Yeah, I think time has given a, a patina of steampunk to the Matrix. Yeah. You know, that kind of... Those big monitors, the keyboards, the manual phones, the six-inch drives, yeah, yeah the wobbliness and, and so on of things. It gives it a steampunk quality. This is also an era, and again, this goes back to those other films I was talking about, this is also an era in which... Um, people were still working out what the internet was yes. and what computers were going to be. Um, I, and you see that so clearly in hackers, for instance, which is bizarre to today's eyes, you know, mm. but it's kind of... it. And I think the reason that you can still watch hackers is not so much... I mean, apart from nostalgia, um, if you watched it at the time, the reason I think you could still watch hackers is not so much about the way the computers work and the way they kind of have these hacking fights, mm. um, but it's more about the ideas of kind yeah. of... It, people having your information or people being able to control you through the computers and that sort of thing those are still quite relevant relevant mm. ideas um, but I think you know there's there's something there is something very dated and funny to our eyes about the way that the way that these the way that these new technologies were being worked through and they were trying to work out visual languages to talk about them and just trying to work out what they were I remember in, in Mission Impossible the first one yes. there's that whole section where um, uh, Ethan Hunt is looking for Job in his yes. hotel room and he starts going on like Usenet groups and typing yeah. in job at 316.com and he's like that's not how an email address works you know yes. but maybe it sort of had something to, maybe it was sort of like how the internet worked back then it was it was a very ad hoc incipient world but all of those things I think changed film narratives so um, dramatically so for example the scene that I remember in that first Mission Impossible film is uh, Emilio Estevez stuck on the lift right looking through his computer laptop in Mm. fact right and how his computer was divided into six screens and so actually by going through the computer you now could cut to six different areas yeah Mm. in a way that made it seamless and coherent and chronological right whereas 
you know, you couldn't do that before. You couldn't you couldn't cut from one area to another. Area. Like the motivation for the movement through the spaces was not there. Whereas you know, the computer instantly gave you that motivation to cut through six different spaces. Yeah, you know. So anyway, that's interesting. One more thing I want to pick up on is the scene with the oracle. Ah, um, yes. And and actually, not so much because of the ideas involved, although it's an ideas scene. Um, but it's because of Gloria Foster's performance. Yes. That was the point of the film where I suppose up until then it had been, you know, doing that thing I was saying about explaining the rules and you learning the world and it's all very entertaining and cool and fun. But that's the point where something emotional about it becomes alive. Yes. And I don't think it's even necessarily about like who Neo is and, and think about because what what the Oracle tells him is you're not the one. You know, you've been told all this time, Morpheus thinks you're the one. I'm here to tell you that you're not. It's not about him being disappointed in that or anything like that. It's something about just her... Warmth. Warmth. Homeliness. And, you know, and her humour. And it's a beautifully written, put together and shot scene. And the she's setting, wonderful. The setting is great. This yes. kitchen. And she says it right to start. Not what you're expecting, right? Yeah. You know, an oracle. You know, where it's yes. a kitchen in a flat in New York. Yes. But also, I want to give credit to the Wachowskis there. Because if you can imagine somebody coming up with an idea of an oracle, you'd never think that the oracle would be, you know, a 60-year-old woman. Black woman. A black woman, yeah. yeah. Well, 60-year-old w- woman and black. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I also don't think that, you know, an oracle would, would have been unlikely that an oracle would have been a woman. You know, would have been, uh, and then to, for it to be a black woman, even more so. I thought that was like, maybe that's a stereotype I can see. To be fair, a kind of a, a, a wise old woman who just sits there alone. It's, thinking. it's always a man under a tree in a forest, an oracle. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, kind of a fortune teller. Sure, <laughs> you know, you could have that as a woman, but an oracle, yeah, right? Maybe. Um, so, and of course, here the oracle is a little bit of a fortune teller. Yeah, which kind of. Um, but it's self-knowing, and you know, so, uh, yeah, again, it's a w- wonderful, wonderful line about don't you know, don't mind about the vase. Yes. What vase? He knocked it over. I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> and then it's, would you have knocked it over if I hadn't said anything? Yes. You know? And then, and they've got laughs in the audience. I mean, I don't. Yes. It's funny the audience actually. I don't know how many of them. Tough to tell how many of them had seen it before. How many were re- revisiting it? How many were seeing it for the first time? Well, there were Tough a lot of fathers and sons watching it. Were there? Yes. They must have thought we were some of them. Are, well, maybe <laughs> uh, we're, we're the, uh, certainly the right age, but there were a lot of people who looked like forty-five or you know early forties, maybe with an eighteen, nineteen-year-old. There, there were a lot of fathers and sons. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting, you know, Cause, and and, it, and it got reactions in all the right places, and that scene in particular got yeah. good laughs. And I yeah. think it's really supposed to. I think yeah. there is there is such there is such warmth and humor yes. in that scene, and and it's such a kind of it became like an emotional centre of the film for me, which I hadn't realised before. Yes, well, it becomes a pivot, right? Because then for the rest of the film, everybody, certainly the audience, is asking, is he or isn't he? Mm. Right? And the, the film is playing on those expectations that, yeah, on this doubt that it now sets up. Yeah, and that's true. It sets it up as a question, which yeah. I don't think I'd ever seen it as a question before, although she poses it. Yeah. I don't think I'd ever seen it as genuinely making the audience think oh maybe he isn't like it's always seemed to me so obvious that he would be ah well for me not you see and actually part of this thinking that maybe he isn't lends a kind of an urgency and a charge to the fight scenes yeah because he might get hurt yeah yeah like so it it, it adds potentiality to how you think yeah kind of things are not as clear cut you don't think oh he'll get out of it because he is the one yeah you think well maybe that's another reason why when he faces that agent yes it's terrifying yes if you if that doubt is in your head yes yeah um can i talk about one more thing just quickly sure is Uh, is is, um because there's a love story in it but i don't think the love story is particularly affecting or even sort of believable. There's, there's definitely, a, there's definitely an affection from Trinity to Neo. You see these kind of looks that linger slightly. Yeah. You know the way she hangs around outside his room. The thing about you know you never brought me dinner. Yeah. You know that sort of thing. So there's clearly an affection there. It's not like you don't believe that she could fall in love with him. Um, but you know, right at the end when she kisses him, he's dead. 
the ship's being broken into, chaos is reigning all around them. It feels like it should be, it's trying to be, a really deeply dramatic, melodramatic even moment. I, well, I think it is. It didn't, that didn't work for me. I don't oh, think well. it ever has worked for me. Well, for me it did. Um, because, you know, basically, and you can tie it to all kinds of things, right? You know, kind of, it's love brings him back to life. It's her love that's kind of, mm. yeah. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, if he is the one, you know, then like, kind of Christ is love. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Like, you can just go on and on with that. And the but, but the situation, I mean, I think it's underplayed, so I can see why it's not perceived as this big melodramatic moment. But in fact, it is written as one. Well, that's what I don't think it is underplayed. Like I say, I think oh. you've got, he's dead and the ship is being invaded by the Sentinels and there's sparks and destruction all around them. It's yes. a huge moment. It's a huge moment, but it is underplayed. Yeah, you could have acted it kind of, mm. you know, you could have acted it more floridly or, you know, given more emphasis to the lines or, but mm. I think she underplays it. I think they both do. Yeah, maybe. Well, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. But the coming back to life is underplayed. Yes. Right? No, that's so, true. um, but I think the moment that actually did affect me emotionally, apart from what I was feeling in the um, Oracle scene, is uh, they've just rescued Morpheus. They're in the helicopter. They're flying off. The helicopter's just been shot, so it's about to crash. They need to land it somewhere if they can. Um, she manages to drop uh, Morpheus and Neo onto a couple of roofs, mm -hmm. and then she's still in the helicopter, about to fly into a building and die, and it's. It's Neo. It's this thing. It's it's the part of the film where Neo is starting to believe about himself that he is the one that he can do these things, and he uh, gets the the sort of rope or whatever the the line that is hmm. connecting that is uh, connected to the helicopter, and the helicopter starts dragging him towards the edge of the roof. And it's like it's kind of a, it's what seems to be a really futile gesture. How can he stop a helicopter? But he's doing it to save her. He's doing it because he believes in himself. And what and the moment of that scene. That sequence, it's not, it's, not, it's not even a full scene. The moment of the sequence that really got me is the shot of Morpheus looking at him, doing it. It's like, it's because Morpheus is the one who's now being doubted by everyone, saying yes. that he's not the one. But, but Morpheus, it's, there's like, it's the, it's like the culmination of his belief in Neo. Yes. You know, what he thought was true. He's yes. got through to him and everything he's been working for matters and and then you know he's looking at him neo doesn't know he's looking at him it's, it's a moment for morpheus mm. i don't know there's something about that that really grabbed me this time mm. yeah okay good <laughs> i'm good i'm really i'm really glad really glad i'm sorry i'm really glad it came back out yes at the cinema because it's a proper cinema movie yes it is um so uh um yeah if you haven't seen it kind of see it if you have seen it see it again it's really worth it it's really one of the great films of the last 20 years uh, and then and then listen to all of the commentary tracks, which are all philosophers. Oh, really? Yeah, Warner Brothers are really into it being a, a kind of a philosophy text. Ah. And so they have a couple of tracks in which philosophers discuss ideas. Of, I haven't listened to any of them yet. Oh, right. Um, but yeah, that's kind of interesting. Mm. They're selling it as that, you know. Right. Oh. Um, well, thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. To listen to. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter, at Eavesdrop Movies, and um, the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>